Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Once upon a time, a politician from a Southeast Asian country wanted to make an important speech. Unfortunately, he forgot his venture. And so he asked his host to find him a spare venture. Miraculously, someone appeared with a box with a box full of dentures. He picked one tried it and found that it worked. And he talked, and he talked, and he talked. The whole almost forgot he stopped talking. After this, this marathon speech, this politician returned the danger to the man who fought it. By the way, he asked, what is your occupation? Undertaker. Undertaker. <laughs> Welcome to another talk in the Jeffrey Chia Distinguished Speaker Series. This is the longest running public speaker series in the country. Over 60 speakers have given their talks since 2005. The person with the highest attendance at this talk is Tan Sri Jeffrey Chia. I can count the number of talks he missed with my fingers. Our talks are open to the public, admission is free. The response has been enthusiastic and we have earned the confidence and respect of the public. This year, two zero one four, we are starting with a big bang. We are partnering 
Ms. Sunway's brand new Jeff Richa Institute on South Asia to organize a talk by the Minister of Finance of the largest and the most resource-rich country in South Asia, namely Indonesia. I will invite the newly appointed president of the Jeff Richa Institute, Wu Wing Kai, to introduce the guest speaker. Before doing so, I wish to say a few words about Wu Wing Kai. Like Tan Sri Muhammad Bakti, Wu Wing Kai hails from Penang. He studied at Swarthmore, Yale, and Harvard. A man of many parts, to quote Shakespeare. He is a professor of economics at the University of Ecclesiastes at Davis. Distinguished Professor at Pudan University in Shanghai and a Director of East Asia Program with the Earth Institute at Columbia University in New York, to name a few. Professor Wu Wing Kai. Your Excellency, Herman Kaino, the Ambassador from Indonesia, Minister Basri, Kato Kwachingte, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest lecture in the Jeffrey Chia Distinguished Speakers Series. As was introduced to you, I am the lucky individual who is the president of the Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia. <coughs> Before into following in the tradition of leaving the best thing to last. Let me first introduce the Jeffrey Chia Institute before introducing our speaker today. The Jeffrey Chia Institute on Southeast Asia is the latest significant large-scale undertaking in the Jeffrey Chia's program on, social, on corporate social responsibility. The JCR is an effort to help the Malaysian government to help free Malaysia from the middle income trap and to put the country onto a path of knowledge led growth. So the two roles of the Jeffrey, the two primary roles of the Jeffrey Cha Institute are one, to conduct research about the experiences of the growth of other countries to see how they could inform the efforts of the Southeast Asian governments to free themselves from the middle income trap. And the second primary objective, which is related to the first, is that to move on to a knowledge-led growth path, we really need to facilitate the transmission of the best ideas and the best international practices from other countries in the world. So what we have done as a very first step is to set up the institute to facilitate the transmission of knowledge and uh, best practices from Harvard University and over time from other leading international centers of learning. And the first step in this transmission of knowledge to Malaysia and the region, we have been begin by first improving the flow of knowledge within Southeast Asia. This is why the first, the maiden activity of the Jeffrey Cha Institute is a talk on Indonesia's experience in handling the negative spillovers from the easy money policy that has been adopted in the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. We have a hard to match person to tell us about his scars earned on the battlefield against the, uh, bad, the, the, the negative spillovers from quantitative easing. 
Minister Khatib Basri, who was a graduate, is a graduate of University of Indonesia, which roughly requires you to be in the 0.01% of the Indonesian population to get into. And he earned uh, his research uh, credentials from the Australian National University. So, F, so the Jeffrey Chia Institute is not only looking at connections with North America, but also with the best institutions in the Southern Pacific. And here, let me invite the minister to come forward and share with us his wisdom on this important question that we are facing. Deputy Governor of Bank Negara, His Excellency Indonesian Ambassador um, to Malaysia, um, Professor Wu Wing Tei, distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to get this invitation to speak in this um, what's the title? Distinguished Speaker Series, Jeffrey Chia Distinguished Speaker Series. And this afternoon, I would like to share my view regarding the Indonesian experience in anticipating the end of easy money or the quantitative easing. Perhaps before that, let me start my remarks by saying something quite provocative. Uh, probably our ambassador here will not be very happy to hear that, but I would like to say that Indonesia is a disappointing country. <laughs> it disappoints the optimists who always expect that the economic growth will achieve 9 to 10 percent, but it also disappoints the pessimists who keep expect that the Indonesian economy will collapse since 1998. So we are always in the middle. And this has to do with the structure of the economy. I know Professor Wu, uh, Tan Sri uh, Jeffrey Chia, one of the problems with the economists when sharing their view or giving a public lecture is they like to talk in the language that nobody understands. <laughs> and the more people confuse, the better they are as an economist. <laughs> but, but this afternoon, let me try to speak in a human language so many of us uh, can share and also uh, learn from this process. So uh, let me start to look at the current situation. So my, my, my talk probably will be uh, fall into two categories. The first one is uh, the current situation, the short-term situation about the Indonesian economy related to the impact of the tapering off. Uh, the second part would be more on the medium and the longer-term perspective. Then, you know, after that, if we do have them, I'll certainly be happy if there are any uh, question or response to it. Uh, first, the most important question to be addressed is a question, why a country like Indonesia which is probably about two years ago, was known as a darling of the foreign investors. All of a sudden, in June, was considered the member of the Fragile Five. The Fragile Five consists of India, Turkey, South Africa, Brazil, and Indonesia. Unfortunately, this happened one month after I was appointed as a finance minister. I don't know whether this has to do with me to become a finance minister that, you know, the Indonesia has no longer become the darling of the, uh, uh, the foreign investor. But let me share with you, this has to do with the two things. 
The first one is, of course, the external sector. The external factors in which the decision made by the Fed to do the tapering off. But the second question is, if this has to do with the external factors, then how do we explain country like Malaysia, who is also affected but not as severe as Indonesia, or maybe Philippines? Then it means that this answer should also be combined with the internal factors. So on those two issues, I'll, I'll, I'll share my view this afternoon. The other question that it is important to look at, it's maybe the question of what Indonesia would be, or not only Indonesia, the emerging market will be after the tapering off. One thing that I would like to share with you, the way I look at the global situation, I think we have to admit, in the past four years, many countries in emerging market in Southeast Asia, we've been living in the abnormal world. Why abnormal? Because in the past four years, we've been supported by the quantitative easing policy produced by the Fed. As a result, some of the money went into emerging market, including Indonesia, also Malaysia, other Southeast Asian countries. But not all of money goes in terms of this format of the portfolio investment, of foreign direct investment. Some of them went into the energy and commodity market as well. As a result, we witnessed that in 2011, the energy price went up quite significantly, the commodity price went up quite significantly. If you look at the trend in the past 10 years, there was a positive correlation between energy price and commodity price. Once the energy price went up, there was a demand, a need for substitute for the energy. <coughs> And CPO, for example, the crude palm oil, it is, I understand very well, Malaysia is also one of the largest exporters of the CPO, get a benefit of it. Not for cooking oil, but for a substitute for the energy. So emerging market, the country like Indonesia, also Malaysia, get benefit of it. And a country like Indonesia, we were really benefited by this because 65% of our export is energy and commodity related. So you can imagine that our trade balance record a very high surplus back on 2011. We had a current account surplus because the commodity boom. At the same time, on the capital account, because this quantitative easing, then the money flowing into the emerging market, including Indonesia, and we had this capital account surplus. So the overall balance, was really good. The Indonesian economy was really in a good shape at the time. The rupiah appreciated even higher or stronger than 9,000 rupiah per US dollar. That happened around 2011. But unfortunately, many people believe this is this kind of things is an equilibrium. In fact, it is not. Because in my um, personal or private conversation with Professor Wu, he reminds me about, probably about a year ago, that someday this quantitative easing policy will end. And we have to leave, we have to come back to the normal world. The normal world is the world without quantitative easing. But unfortunately, in the past four years, we are not accustomed to it. So the good question is, what would happen if they stay bring off happen. The best answer to do it, I don't want to make a forecast of it because one of the problems with the economists, they are very good in explaining about what's going to happen in the future in a very, and later on, in a very convincing way, explain why the prediction was wrong. <laughs> so, so I don't want to sort of like make a prediction about the number. But let me share with you, perhaps the best indicators to look at is the world when the world without quantitative easing. So when I refer to the Indonesian economy, if you look at the US, US economy, before the QE happened, for example, the yield of the 10 years government bond in the US was around 3 to 3.5%. It is more or less, now it's around 2.8, 2.9, almost reached that level. And 
The interesting part is the rupiah before the QE was around this level. But not many people realize because we thought that the strong rupiah for the 9,000 was the equilibrium. In fact, before the QE, we were about the same, similar to the government bonds. So what I was trying to say is actually in Indonesia or also in Malaysia, we are moving back into the new normal, the equilibrium. Then the main important question for the policymaker is how to navigate this process, the trajectory path back to the equilibrium. A country like Indonesia, unfortunately, we had a problem with the trauma in 1998 due to the Asian financial crisis. So every time the rupiah depreciated, then it reminds people again that there is a possibility of the Asian financial crisis would happen. I would like to share with you this current situation is completely different. We are not in the 1998 situations compared to the 2008. There are several reasons for it. In 1998, the first one is we adopted the fixed exchange rate. So people not accustomed to the fluctuation of the rupiah. Most of the company, they didn't do hedging. But now, since the exchange rate is flexible, most of the company, they had already. Maybe some people, they are quite happy with the depreciation of uh, rupiah because they already some put their money in the dollar. So we don't see any panic in the market. The second one, the situation in the banking sector in Indonesia in 1998 was, I would say, was really bad. The non-performing loans was more than 30% at the time. Now the NPL, the non-performing loans, was less than 4%. So the banking sector is in a healthy, a very healthy condition. The other thing, the political stability. In 1998, it was the end of era of the former President Suharto. What, what happened in 1998, I call it vote by dollar. If you don't have your trust or confidence to the government, what you do is just you convert the rupiah into the US dollar. But now, since we do have this democratic system, even though it's noisy, but not a threat. Because if you don't like the government, you can criticize government every day. If you are a government official, what you need to do is just switch the channel from the local TV into the travel and living. <laughs> that will be nice. So the situation is quite different. Now that's, that's, that's the background comparison between 98 and 2008. Now, if the tapering of it's really the, the culprit or the source of problem, then the question is why country like Malaysia is only affected by if I'm not mistaken, you depreciated by 6% yeah, of the ringgit compared to us 26% or compared to Turkey or Brazil. It is very interesting to look at there are similar characteristics of the country who are affected severely by this tapering off. First, they do have problems in the foreign liabilities vis the US dollar in terms of relatively high amount. The second one, relatively low reserve. The third one, either they get a problem on the current account deficit or fiscal deficit. If you look at Brazil, they got a problem on the current account deficit. If you look at India, they got a problem on the current account deficit or fiscal deficit. Turkey, the current account deficit. Indonesia, current account deficit. We don't have much problem in the fiscal deficit because our debt to GDP is less than 24%. Last year, our budget deficit was 2.2%. And this year, the target would be around 1.6%. So we don't have much problem on the, on the fiscal issue. Yeah, in terms of fiscal cut, I'm not to worry so much. But the main concern is on the current account deficit. Because in the second quarter of 2013, our current account deficit reached around 10 billion US dollar with this 4.4% of GDP. With this perceived by the market, the economy will not be sustainable. As a result, then, you know, on the portfolio side, there was a capital outflow. Unfortunately, 
This happened only one month after I was appointed as a minister. So, as a response towards it, I learned a lot from Professor Wu. Uh, I always, you know, a big fan of Professor Wu. When he explained, again, economics in the human language in a very simple way, if we do have a problem with the current account deficit, you have two options. First, you deal with the issue on the government budget, or you deal with the issue of the saving investment. On my part, as a Minister of Finance, I have to deal with the issue of the government budget. Why government budget? Because around 20, 20 probably around 20% of our government budget was allocated, is allocated for the fuel subsidy. Can you imagine 250 million out of 1,400 trillion? Yeah, it's probably more or less around 20, around 18 to 20 percent was allocated for the fuel subsidy. And this subsidy is just not right. Why? Because the one who get a benefit from this fuel subsidy is middle and upper class. The poor people, the direct link to the fuel subsidy is if they use the public transport. Since because they are too poor, they cannot afford to buy a car. So the direct link is only through the public transport. So the one who get a benefit from this fuel subsidy is only the middle and upper class. But typical of the country with the transition of democracy, the middle class is always noisy. In terms of number of people, not many, but they are very strong in newspaper, in media, etc. So the first policy that I prepared just one month after I was appointed as a finance minister, I adjusted the fuel price by 44%. And I relocate this money for the poor people. Why? Because it is better to redistribute this money to the direct cash transfer or conditional cash transfer. Of course, the question is how to target the poor. Because it's very difficult, we don't have the good social security system like in the US, we don't have the single identification number like India, so how do we transfer this money to the poor people? This is the trick. You have to allocate the money, the number should be slightly above the poverty line, but not too high to make people lazy, to withdraw them from the labor market. Because if you give a lot of money, then they are not going to work. So we add 25% above the poverty line. We do a sort of like um, identification by name, by address, and people queuing. Of course, there is a risk that maybe not the poor people will also queuing. But my question is very simple. If you are not poor, are you willing to spend about four hours, five hours in queuing only to get $5? I don't think the middle and upper class is willing to queue to get only five dollars because the transaction cost is too high for you. So even though it's mistargeted, it's go to the near pool with this kind of system. I call this policy a triple winning policy. This is good for macro because by adjusting the fuel price by 44%, it will reduce the consumption of fuel with this probably around 15 is probably around 3% of our total import. The second one, this is good for the redistribution because we relocate this money for the poor people to the direct cash transfer. And the third one, this is good for environment. Because by raising the fuel price, then it will reduce the demand for the fossil fuel. So I adjusted the fuel price by 44% and provide the cash transfer. I know the consequences. Even my wife get mad at me because this policy. The solution is very simple. Don't read the local newspaper for about one month. <laughs> Just read the Financial Times or Wall Street Journal because they will applaud you. But the local newspaper said, this minister is stupid and crazy. You know? Just, just watch the travel and living. It's much nicer to look at the... So that's the first policy that we did. I do understand that if we do have a problem in the current account deficit, it reflects the excess demand. Because the strong middle class, the strong demand cannot entirely be supported by our supply, the capacity of production. That is why the import increase. 
The solution is very simple. Either you expand the supply, increase the, product, the production, or you reduce the demand. The ideal one is expanding the supply. I still remember I sent an email to Professor Wu during that day and I said that I asked him an advice. What kind of supply side policy is needed? We, we exchange email. This is, you know, because this already happened and I can openly share with you. And he shared with me about the importance of infrastructure on the supply side. I do understand that infrastructure, I will talk about it later on. But in the short term, if you have to wait for infrastructure, then your current account will continue to deteriorate. So you only have one option. You have to reduce the demand. So it means that somehow we have to do a tightening, stabilization on our macroeconomic policy. So we decided to tighten the fiscal. The budget deficit we announced in the parliament will to be tightened from 2.4% of GDP as a number of budget deficit to become 1.6% by 2014. My colleague at the central bank, he raised the interest rate by 175 basis points. Of course, this is not something uh, very good for the economy. As a result, the economy slowed down. But Indonesia still has a cushion for growth. Because until the end of the year, the economy will continue to grow around 5.8%. Whereas if you compare among the G20 members, we're still the second fastest growing economy. China got about 7.6%. If Indonesia 5.8%, India is about 4.4%, Turkey is about the same. So we still have the cushion for growth. But we cannot continue to be like this all the time. In addition to that, we prepare some policy packages. I do understand if the economy slow down, then there will be an impact on unemployment. A country like Indonesia, the issue of the social unrest is a very sensitive, politically sensitive. So what we prepare from the Ministry of Finance at the time, we provide a fiscal incentive. The incentive work this way. If the company prevent or not to delay off, we will provide them with the fiscal incentive by reducing the installment of their tax. And with this policy, there are about 69 companies registered to the government. So we could save probably around 200, around 280,000 jobs because of this policy. So we give you the cushion with the fiscal incentive, then, you know, but uh, you have to make a sort of like agreement that you won't lay off the labor. So we work closely with the Minister of Industry and also the Minister of Labor. But the main question is, if you provide a fiscal incentive, then there is a danger because this might create or give a pressure for a deficit. Right? But the problem in Indonesia, unlike in many countries, the problem in Indonesia is always how to spend the money. Why? Because it's not always easy. After we have this anti-corruption committee, people are afraid to do a tender project because usually, you know, many of the cases of the tender project end up with put them in prison <laughs> because corruption. In the past, probably during the Suharto era, if you spare, spend the money for the local government, you probably get a kickback, I don't know, 10, 15% or maybe even 30%. So there is incentive for you to spend the money. But now, you don't get a kickback, but you have a risk to be put in prison. So there is not much incentive for the government to spend the money. In addition to that, with the decentralization, most of the money went into the local government, 60%. And we cannot control them. So the spending is relatively small. My approach is, I always pragmatic. If you cannot spend the money, then why don't you just give a fiscal incentive? You will end up with the same budget deficit anyway. Not because I'm a sort of like pro of Republican, but I'm very, just very pessimistic, very pragmatic out of it. I would like to maintain the budget deficit certain level. We tax the money from the people, but we cannot spend. Okay, if that's the case, then provide fiscal incentive. So that's two policies from the government we prepare to anticipate. From the monetary side, there is the interest rate by 175 basis points. As a result, in the past three months, 
we had the trade surplus already. We booked the trade surplus on October, on November. The next data may come probably beginning of February, but our prediction at the Ministry of Finance, we may book a trade surplus almost 900 million US dollars from deficit. So the current account deficit in 2013, the second quarter was about 4.4% of GDP, will decline to become probably around less than 3% of GDP by the fourth quarter. So 2013 and 2014 would be the consolidation year. We have to accept um, a sort of like stabilization or maybe slowdown of the economic growth. For 2014, maybe the economy may continue growth 5.8 to 6%. But we cannot continue to be like this. Why? Because a country like Indonesia, we need to grow by more than 6.5% or 7%. Because every year, the new entrance to the labor market is about 2.4 million people. And 1% growth will absorb probably around 400,000 people or maybe 200,000, 300,000. So if you grow by only 6%, you will only be able to maintain sort of like the same unemployment level. So you have, we have to grow faster. But if we grow faster, then there is a problem. The import will jump. Then there will be a problem on the current account deficit. If I may speak with the, with the number, the rule of thumb is more or less like this. If we want to create jobs, we need to grow by about 6.5 to 7 percent. Every 1 percent growth in Indonesia will require capital output ratio or incremental capital output ratio around 5.3. So if you grow by 7, it means that your investment over GDP must be around 38 to 40 percent. The problem is our current domestic savings is only 33. So if you rely on this foreign investment for the 7% of the uh, current account deficit, this will not be sustainable. So somehow we need to do some adjustment. That is why the stabilization is very important. So the question is, how do we address this? Let me share with you during the IMF and World Bank meeting in Washington, um, since Indonesia is part of the, uh, the, the so-called the Freedom Five, and the IMF, IMFC, the IMF Council meeting, I was asked to share my view regarding this impact of the tapering off to the emerging market together with the uh, governor of the Central Bank of India, uh, Raghuram Raja. My point is, I do understand that we need to give this stabilization, but we at the emerging market, we don't want to be punished. It's simply because the US decided to do the tapering off, and we at the emerging market should bear the cost. The economy, the Indonesian economy, was pretty good until June. Then Chairman Bernanke said that we have a plan to taper off. Not yet an action, only a plan. And you know what happened? After this, the rupiah collapsed more than 20%. So my comment at the time is it is very important to have this policy coordination because the roadmap of the Fed will have a major impact on emerging markets. We do understand that we need the strong growth of the U.S. economy. But if this happens at the expense of an emerging market, then don't forget, at the end of the day, the market, the buyer will also come from the emerging market. If the U.S. economy continues without an import from the emerging market, you don't have the market anyway. So what we need to do, the strategy is how to improve together, to get a growth together, both in the advanced country and also in the emerging market. So the solution of it is we cannot continue come up with the policy with reducing demand, with the tightening fiscal, with the tightening monetary policy. This could be acceptable for the short term. On the medium term and the long term, and this is my, my second part, we have to focus on what I call the supply side. What is the supply side? If we want to ensure that our economy could achieve 7%, or 6.5%, this need to be supported by good infrastructure. Otherwise, we got a supply problem. Look at India. India has a similarity with us. Got a supply side problem. The demand is too strong, not supported by good infrastructure, and end up 
with the inflation. So the monetary policy should be restrained, should be constrained until a certain level. So the solution for this from the Indonesian side is the supply side. Let me talk first about infrastructure. The problem with the infrastructure in Indonesia is the land procuring. During the uh, private lands, Tan Sri Jeffrey asked me about this land issue. And I shared with uh, Tan Sri Jeffrey Shah that until two years ago, we in Indonesia, we didn't have the eminent domain law. So if there is one family refuse to surrender their land, then we cannot build the road. But if you, any of you, go to Bali, because we, we held this APEC conference last year in Bali, then you can see the new toll road above the sea, across the sea. And we built this toll road less than one year. Why have we been able to build this toll road less than one year? Because there is no land issue. So in the case of Indonesia, it's much easier to create a miracle like Moses rather than do a land procurement. <laughs> and here is the problem. So once we settle this issue about this land procuring, then we can build the infrastructure. But unfortunately, the new land bill has been passed. But there is a transition period towards that. It costs us probably about three years. So I believe by 2015, the new law will be fully enacted then we can build the infrastructure so easily. The good thing about this new land bill is the main issue about the land is always about the price. If you have a dispute about the land price, then you can go to the court. And within 90 days, the court will make a decision. If you disagree, you can make a appeal. And another 18 days, so in total about 108 days, you can get the certainty about the land price and you can build a road. Yeah, so the land procuring is really the main issue. But I do believe that by the new land bill has been passed, the transition by 2015, I'm quite optimistic that we could achieve the 7% growth. The second issue related on the supply side is the quality of the human capital. And this particular issue, I really appreciate the initiative take by Tan Sri uh, Dr. Jeffrey Chia by establishing the Tan Sri uh, the Jeffrey Chia Institute for Southeast Asia, chaired by my good friend Professor Wu. I think investing in human capital, this is something very important. Let me share my view with you. I don't know, many of you is probably the business people from the mining, the um, uh, oil and gas company, but this is the way I look at the situation. Now, in the past, at least in the past three years, we witnessed the new development in which the U.S. producing the shell gas. The shell gas, they can produce a gas probably less than $3. I'm not saying that U.S. will export this because if you're talking about gas, the transportation costs, etc., will be very expensive. But by having gas with a very cheap price, somehow, I don't know how, how, how big is it, this will make U.S. become less dependent to the Middle East. This will change the configuration of the energy balance. If U.S. become less dependent to the Middle East, then maybe the energy price may go down. And if you look at in the past 10 years, there was a positive correlation between energy price and commodity prices. So country like Indonesia, if the energy price going down, the commodity price going down, our export, 65% of our export is energy and commodity related. And this definitely will affect us. So if we're talking about medium term and the long term, a country like Indonesia, we cannot continue to rely only on raw materials, on resources. We somehow have to move into what we call innovation, technology. But when I talk about technology, doesn't mean that I would like to talk or you know share the same view with the former president Habibi that would like to produce a skyrocket or airplane industry. If you're talking about technology, let me give a very simple 
um, a good example about technology. For example, in Ghana, there is no way that Indonesia can continue to produce cheap garment because we need to compete with the Bangladesh. The Bangladeshi, their wages is only one third compared to us. We can compete with them. But with the growing middle class, there is a room for us to stay in the garment business if we improve the quality by design. Producing batik. Now with the growing middle class, people willing to spend thousands of US dollars to buy batik for fashion. So we go into the niche market. Not many people realize that Victoria's Secret is actually produced in Indonesia, but of course cannot be distributed and circulated in Indonesia. Why? In terms of quality, we are pretty good. But since we don't have bread, then we cannot sell. So it means that in the future, we probably need to think about to have our own bread. That's what I call the innovation. Doesn't mean we will produce a sort of like airplane. So move into what I call the knowledge-based economy. Not in the extreme way. And the investment in human capital is very important here. I'm not a big fan of the industrial policy. You know, because if you want to produce something, the manufacturing, somehow probably you need to sort of like to do a picking winner. To support, to allocate a certain you know, money to one particular sector. In our history in Indonesia, government is very bad in picking winner, but losers are very good in picking government. <laughs> and that's always end up with the rent seeking. You try to get this picking winner, but end up with the rent seeking for the group of business who are close to power, close to the group of ministers, to the presidents. So we need to avoid this. So the question is, what kind of industrial policy that could be justified of it? In my view, if you want to protect domestic industry, not by giving a protection at the outcome, but perhaps you can give the government assistance on the process. It means that probably you can provide a tax incentive for R&D, for human capital, for training. And this is the thing that we are working on at the Ministry of Finance. We provide a tax deductible if the company would like to do an R&D in Indonesia. I can, I can share with you this is not an advertisement. A company like L'Oreal, for example, just opened about a year ago its largest cosmetic factory in the world with its R&D in Indonesia. Daihatsu started to open up the R&D in Indonesia. <clears throat> and now they export about 1,000 units per month to Japan. If we do have an R&D, then we need people. But the problem is in Indonesia, probably the situation is different with Malaysia, is about the quality of the human capital. We do have a vocational training, but unfortunately many of them came or graduated from the government training center. I'm not, even though, you know, I'm, I'm a minister of finance, I have to admit that the quality of people who graduate from the government training center is not a good one. Why? Because the budget is limited. Maybe the equipment is outdated. If most of us now if we would like to do a word processing, we use, I don't know, it's Microsoft Word document or something. Maybe they still use WordStar or, I don't know, Lotus maybe. When it's back, about, you know, many of, some of students here probably never heard about this uh, WordStar or Lotus, probably back. It's, it's on the Jurassic Park. It was on the Jurassic Park. Uh, probably 30 years ago when I was in high school. It means that everyone who graduated from the government training center, we need to retrain them again. So my idea is, why don't we ask the private sector to do a training and give a tax deductible? It's much easier on the job training, give a tax deductible. That kind of policy will help to improve the human capital. And this has to do with, Professor you mentioned, if you look at the history of the economic development, there were three countries entered the middle income. It was Brazil, South Africa, 
and South Korea. And only South Korea managed to become the new industrial economies. Brazil and South Africa remain as a resource Swiss countries with the fluctuation. So it means that a country like Indonesia, we have to move into that direction. We have to, to I have to appreciate about my, my predecessor, the seniors, the architect of the Indonesian economy built for a foundation of the economy under the Suharto. But probably we have to move into the new paradigm with more into the human capital, investing in human capital and knowledge based economy. The third issue related to the supply side, what I call the intangible asset. The future, in the future, the comparative advantage of the country will no longer on the physical asset. But that will be on the intangible asset. What is the intangible asset? It's policy. Policy matters in terms of is doing business. Unfortunately, I openly say this in the cabinet meeting, and I said to, I reported to my president, jokingly I said that one of the reasons why many Indonesian become, become religious is because they have to deal with the government. You know what? You come to register, to get a license, you submitted a document, and you'll never know how long this will be completed. The only thing that you can do is only pray. <laughs> until something happens. This is simply not right. So we need to do something about certain things. Before I took this job, as a Minister of Finance, I chaired the investment board. Let me share with you my experience there. I was thinking, if I were an investor from New York, would like to invest in Indonesia, I won't fly from New York, I don't know, 5,000, 6,000 business class ticket from New York to Jakarta only to gather information. What I need to do is just to check from the internet about the potential. When I look at the website at my office at the time, I get myself, I myself get confused. <laughs> because it only consists about presidential decree number X, because nobody can understand it unless you are specialized in the government regulation. Right? So I said that it means that we need to improve this website. So it's more friendly. It's like investor for dummies. Then if we don't understand about the website, then probably people will call. So I tried to call my own office. And you know what happened? Nobody picked up the phone. <laughs> so I said that the reform should start from something very easy. The reform start by picking up the phone. And you send an email. One of the problems of many Indonesians is they don't reply email. So I said that, okay, this is the first thing. You have to pick up the phone. You have to reply. But how can I monitor this? So I required them to do, to record every conversation. And randomly I check every two months. The idea is very simple. If you listen about this conversation, then you know what kind of trainings are needed to improve the quality. Right? By doing this. And this is the first step. As a result, you know, there's an improvement of it. And I'll ask the people, to certain people, to sort of like, if email come, and should be CC to one person who is responsible for that. Just to ensure. I'm not talking about the quality, at least to acknowledge that your email has been received. Yeah, the, the next step is, every time people submitted the document, they never know about the status of their document. So what I did, if you submit the document, we provide the PIN. Using this PIN, you can access in which table your document stuck. If your document stuck in one or particular table for about three days, then you can complain to me. So my job was very easy. Because people complain, then I just forward it to my deputy. And I know for sure, business people, they are professional complainers. If you give them a chance to complain, they will do it. And this is good for me, because they work for me for free. Because if you establish a committee, you need to pay them. 
But if you let the business people to complain, they will do it every day, every minute, because they are a professional complainer. Yeah. So this is this is the way it look. It just show how the reforms start. I try to adopt in my office. Then I speak to my president. I said that probably this system can be adapted to other line ministries. The problem with the reform is sometimes we always come up with the idea to go for the uphill battle. The problem with the reform is the cost is immediate, but the benefit is always in the medium term. Sometimes you losing steam. You don't gain the political support. As a result, you lose. So if you want to, to start with the reform, start with something very small. You gain the credibility and you move to the next stage. This is my experience. So handling the issue of bureaucratic holders is a very important one. And country like Indonesia, let me be open and frank with you. One of the key issues this related to the bureaucratic hurdles is corruption. Jokingly, I said that money is not problem, but by creating problem, you earn money. <laughs> That's the bureaucratic hurdle. Yeah? So, on the issue of corruption, this is very important. For us. How to do, how do we deal with this issue, especially with the decentralization? We give the autonomy to the local government. It is good, but at the same time, we export the corruption from the central government to the local government without asking whether they need the corruption or not. <laughs> this makes things in Indonesia different. Different between 1998 and the current situation. Why is that? Under Suharto, the power was very centralized around Suharto. So if the business people the corruption was very high, but the economic growth was also around 7.6% of it, was very high. So the growth has less to do with the corruption. The growth has to do with the certainty, not the corruption per se. In the past, you came to this one particular family. Once they agree, everything will be set up from the top level until the lowest level. So the corruption was very efficient. But with the fragmentation of power, with the local government, now people have to deal with the central government, with the parliament, with the local government. So your transaction cost per bribe is increasing. <laughs> One thing that I learned from this process, there is something worse than organized corruption, which is unorganized corruption. <laughs> and this is happening. Now how do we deal with this issue? Because, because we cannot just say, identify this is the problem of corruption. Then it reminds me, when I was in the University of Indonesia, we conducted research jointly and collaborated with the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research. It was very interesting when we launched the decentralization back in 2001, the share of extra cost to the total production cost. Extra cost means anything that you have to pay besides the legal tax basically bribes, was around 12%. Of course, if you ask people, are you paying bribes? The answer is, of course, no. But if you're paying an extra test, the answer is yes. <laughs> the share of extra cost to total production cost was around 12%. Eight years after that, we conducted the similar research. And this extra cost declined to become 8%. How do we explain this? The explanation was competition. Competition among the local government actually push them to adjust themselves because they want investment to come. So they start to do an improvement. So I learned from that, that process that competition is very important. So every year, we do have to provide an award to the local government who provide a good investment climate. But unfortunately, this is not enough because if you are the head of local districts, every year you get a medal, until everything, you don't have any room anymore for the matter. Then what's the point? So I said that we should create incentive and disincentive mechanism. What is happening in Indonesia with this decentralization? It reminds me with the principal agent problem. The principal is the central government, the agent is the local government. Because we give the decentralization and the head of district directly elected by the local government, the central government do not have any power on that. So the, the agent could disobey the principle. 
The only solution for the principal agent problem is you have to create incentive and disincentive mechanism. Now, my ministry, I asked my DG to prepare a sort of like reward and penalty mechanism. Maybe we need to increase the special allocation fund greater than the general allocation fund. The general allocation fund is something that allocated for every region, regardless you perform or not. But if we use a special allocation fund, we can use this as a carrot and stick. Then we can continue to talk about this infrastructure, about this um, uh, human capital. This can be used as an incentive. Yeah? And if you're talking about this supply set, we've been talking about the infrastructure, the quality of human resources, uh, about the bureaucratic hurdles, one thing that I would like to emphasize and share with you is also important is political stability. Many people, this will be the last part of my uh, remarks, many people ask me about what would happen in Indonesia beyond the election 2014. And this is very crucial. I can fully understand that every candidate, usually before the elections, always come up with a political gimmick. With a nationalism sentiment, with a kind of policy, the populist sentiment. Yeah. But one thing that I would like to share with you, this is my experience. Good times makes bad policy and bad times makes good policy. We are not really in the good times now. It was very difficult to convince the government to adjust the fuel price. But once the U.S. did the tapering off, it was much easier for us to do some adjustment on the, uh, to reduce uh, the, the, the fuel subsidy. So, which is very normal, because the politician always thinks, why should I spend my political capital if the economy is in a good shape? But if the economy is not in a good shape, then we should spend our political capital. Now, the last part is about the election. What will happen after the election? I do believe that the economic policy will be more or less consistent to maintaining this good macroeconomic stability. Why is that? I mentioned to you this number. Every politician, every president, if they want to stay in power, they need to create jobs to reduce poverty. It means they have to produce those 7%. The investment over GDP should be around 40%. Our domestic savings will not be enough. So the only thing that we can do is we need to become investor friendly. Otherwise, there is no way that economy can be violent. If you ask me about the potential, the potential is really there. Indonesia is a country with 240 million. If you're talking about ASEAN, 600 million, the size of our economy is probably about 50% of the total ASEAN economies. The size of the population is probably around 48% of the total ASEAN population. So if you're talking about the potential market, it's really there. Let me give a very anecdotal evidence about this growing middle class. Ambassador uh, must be very familiar with this part. One of the problem in Indonesia is if you have a sort of like cocktail party or uh, you know reception, you ask Indonesian to do an RSVP, they never reply. <laughs> Why? Because every time we go to the party, the food is always there. We don't understand the concept of scarcity in terms of food, etc. We never reply for RSVP. But no, if you come to Jakarta, if you go fancy for a fine dining restaurant, if you don't make a booking, just few days before, you won't get the table. This just shows that how the growing middle class is coming. I can imagine Dr. Jeff Richard, when I look at your theme park, it reminds me about the future business. Because with the growing middle class, people will start to look at leisure, health, and education. So if you're talking about Tansri Javicha, it's very efficient. This is something has to do with demographic deficit, with the growing income per capita, then those three issues, education, health, and also lessons, including like impact, there will be a rising demand.
And similar like in Indonesia, I can I can see that the business on this particular level grew very fast. Yeah. So talking from this perspective, I will say that in the current situation now, the macroeconomic stability got a little problem, but improved. Is back to the normal situation. But I believe in the future, Indonesia can maintain the strong and robust growth. And this will enhance this cooperation with our neighbor, Malaysia. One thing before I conclude, I would like to remind you, as a disclaimer, investing in Indonesia is very dangerous because it's addictive. <laughs> That was certainly the voice of the young Indonesian. The Indonesia that has stood up in Southeast Asia to be counted and to provide an example for economic reform and reforms in other dimensions everywhere. So let us not waste this opportunity of being able to talk directly with the finance minister and in order to maximize uh, participation I would like to take two questions at a time so please uh, come to the mention your name and then uh, gather the questions please go. the honorable minister I think you have given a very insightful and candid talk in fact, I'm in fact very impressed and surprised that you are so critical about Indonesia yourself. A lot of ministers from the country will be selling their country, but you are on, never in a denial of your weaknesses, which I'm very impressed and touched by. I want to ask you a question regarding manpower. Do you suffer brain drain issue in Indonesia? And that's one question I want to know. Thank you. Sir, mention your name, please. Uh, my name is Joab. Uh, good yeah. afternoon, Dr. Nomad and all the audience. American says, dollar is our currency, but your problem. So what are the best ways to solve the problem? Thank you. To solve the currency problem. That's the issue of the brain drain. Probably, we, this is already happening, that way. But probably not in the scale like what's been happening in India. Or maybe I don't know. It's maybe in Malaysia, yeah. Because again, in in Indonesia, if we're talking about the quality of the human resources. I have to be honest with you. We are a bit like behind. If you're talking about the education level attainment, we are below uh, definitely uh, Malaysia or Philippines. But some good people, um, they work in Singapore now, also in Malaysia now, especially related to the IT to the um, financial sector. But since the number of this percentage is still very limited, so not, not much affected by this. But I can imagine in the future, this will be the problem for us. Um, about the second question about the, the, the currency, there are two issues here. The first one is, I think we have to admit that maybe we have to let the Indonesia back to the so-called the normal level. This is, I mentioned to you, the level of exchange rate before the quantitative easing, more or less around this level. But in terms of to do to improve the policy in Indonesia, I have to say that we have to do a bit of everything. We cannot let the currency to depreciate or to work as shock absorber, because we had a trauma back in 1998, so we let the currency to depreciate somehow with the central bank intervene to do to smooth the volatility. We have to raise the interest rate a little bit, but not too much because it's one, it will affect the banking sector. We have to tighten the fiscal. But more or less, I would say that in the past two months at least, the currency is more or less stable. Today was a very strong impact on the currency market because the problem of the peso collapse in Argentina and also the because the purchasing manager index in China is still quite significant. So I can imagine rupee, Indonesian rupiah, and also ringgit was under pressure today. Thank you. Next round of questions. 
this to up your affiliation. Um, I'm Erwin Tan from KPS uh, Consulting Baha. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Bomak uh, Chati. I understand that you have increased your petrol price by 4 percent which I believe that will cause the cost push uh, inflation. So I would like to know how does the government going to manage this cost inflation in terms of uh, increase of cost of living and maybe suffering to the middle and uh, lower poorer uh, segment. Thank you. Sir? Uh, good afternoon, dear honorable guests. Uh, Selamat sore, Pak David. Uh, my name is Nampuna. I'm currently a PhD student in Monash University in Malaysia. Um, I noticed that the dispersion of the population in Indonesia is mainly in Java and in Sumatra. And uh, I'm very sure that the uh, uh, economic, most of the economic contributions come from these two islands. Um, just recently, last month, I visited Montana for the first time. And I see it is still far away developed from Java and Sumatra. What I'd like to find out is that from your perspective as a Minister of Finance, um, how do you expect to uh, boost the economic growth without actually letting um, these big islands such as Kalimantan or Papua to have um, improved uh, growth as well. Well, I understand that the human capital will be the biggest uh, problematic situation that you can uh, come up with, but perhaps um, transportation? Is it going to work in this time today? Thank you very much. So the first question of the benefits from the day. Thanks, Wayne. Well, the first question, this is very interesting about the inflation. I probably spent most of half of my career by proposing fuel price adjustment. In 2005, I proposed to the president who was working as his advisor, the vice chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors at the time, we proposed 30% increase of the fuel price. On October, I proposed 120%. October 2000, uh, June 2008, 30%. Now, when I was a minister of finance, uh, when I was appointed, just one month after I was appointed, I adjusted by 44%. Why I believe this will not have a major impact? Because this is typical of administered price. It's once of inflation. It increased, and after three months, then, the inflation decline. The only thing that you have to ensure is the price of food. Because the poor people, the bundle consumption of the poor people, they spend most on food rather than uh, gasoline. But of course, with the increase of the fuel price, there will be an impact on the, on the food price. So how do we mitigate this? What we did, we uh, I spoke to the Ministry of um, Trade, my colleague Gita Wiryawan, and I, I also proposed this to the President, why don't we just open up the agriculture sector related to the food products. So we remove the quota on beef, on shallot, on garlic, we lower the import tariff on soybean, because the one who really benefit by this liberalizing this food product is actually the poor because net consumer most of them are net consumer they are not net producer so we remove this quota by allowing import we've been able to maintain the volatile food so within three months the inflation dropped until the end of the year the inflation was around 8.3 percent Decline from around maybe almost 10 percent at the time after the we adjusted the fuel price. Your second question, I entirely agree. I think the answer is logistics. If you happen to go to Papua, the price of these mineral waters in Papua is probably about 10 times compared in Java. One pack of cement in Java it costs you about six dollars, but in Papua 120 dollars. Can you imagine about 20 times? Because logistics, because landlock. So the solution of it is, I do believe in infrastructure. But of course, we cannot expect that the private sector will go to the big island, you call it Sumatra, and there is a room for the fiscal policy here. The government could provide an incentive if the project is not commercially viable. That's the role of the fiscal policy. But if this commercially viable, you let the private sector to do it. 
So we focus on the remote area. And by you know, building this infrastructure, I do believe that we could reduce the logistic costs, which is somehow the key opener to sort of like improvement of the welfare in other islands outside Java. Thank you. Uh, I should defer to the wise governor of the Central Bank. A young woman, Dr. Mohamed Chanti, you have given us a very innovative approach to economic planning and implementation. I see that you're dealing with issues one by one as they come up. And I'd like to say, to tribute to you, that I wish I could follow, we could follow your example. So you have said uh, we, are, we are going to the Middle East Congress get us, <clears throat> as Professor Wu said. I think Indonesia too is going to this Middle East contract. Your comment on that and your suggestion that you must emphasize the supply side. And then you related it very rightly in my view too to education, human resources manpower development. But that takes a long gestation period. What would you do in the meantime to break up from the middle income trap, looking at it from the supply side and human resource development? Thank you. From Bangal, Malaysia. Uh, excellent remarks, uh, Your Excellency. I have two questions. One is your views on the uh, financial services integration within ASEAN. Second, is your opinion on whether Asia should have our own monetary fund, given the impossibility of reforming the international financial architecture? Very tough question. <laughs> There's two, two, two very tough questions about the middle income plan. Let me share with you, I'm a very pragmatic person. I know the most of the economic solution, right? if you look at the read the textbook or the paper produced by good academic like Professor Wu, they always come up with the first best solution. But unfortunately, we are not living in the first best world. We are living in the second best world, running by the third best bureaucracy. <laughs> this is the reality. So put a constraint as given that institutional cannot be changed within one night. So we have to be very pragmatic on this policy, including this middle income track. Yeah, let me share with you. This is my criticism to my colleague from the World Bank and IMF. They always come up with a very good policy, require first rate institution, but can only be implemented 25 years from now. <laughs> we need something very, very, very concrete. Yeah. Um, for example, like technology like the middle income plan. Of course, the solution is would be education. I'm still on the process for this, but of course I know this is not easy. That is why I really, I envy Tan Sri Jeffrey Chia regarding having this university in collaboration with foreign university. Many Indonesians would like to go to overseas, spend the money. Why don't we just open up a sort of like foreign campus back home? This is at the university level. The second one is the vocational training. We should focus on this. I don't expect that this vocational training will come from this like only polytechnic or the government um, training center. My approach is, I know the government ability is limited. Why don't we ask private sector to do it? To do a private, to do a sort of like training, to do a vocational training. In return, they got a tax deductible. This will be very fit for them because we never know about what kind of people they need. So I can share with you when Jeff Imad, Jeff Imad from GE came to Jakarta last year, we had a long conversation and I talked to Jeff and I said that, why don't you have this training center here in Indonesia? I'm happy to, if this is related to the human capital, we can talk about the possibility of tax deductible I do believe with the technology spillover from the foreign direct investment. So if you want to get this, a very short-term solution to it is you get this technology spillover 
by letting people work in the private sector. Of course, it will not be ideal, but somehow there will be a technology spillover of it. Yeah, of course, cannot entirely answer this. Uh, your second question, uh, Excellency, regarding this, uh, the financial services integration. This is very important and interesting. If you look at on the pattern or the stylus spec in many uh, cases of the economic development, usually one country reaches a certain level of manufacturing to GDP, then move into the services sector. Let's say 30%, 40%. But look at the current situation. Only 15% and 20%, they move to the financial sector, to the services sector, including financial sector. Daniel Roderick called it the premature deindustrialization. But my answer towards this is not, it's not a premature deindustrialization. It is because outsourcing. You don't need to create a sort of like to boot everything. So it means that the role of this uh, services sector becomes very crucial. We need to use the services sector as an input, including the financial sector. So I can see this integration of the financial sector is very important. But of course, the political process is not always easy on this. There are some sensitive issues. Yeah, I don't want to mention about some sensitive issues uh, related to some regulations, the national regulations. But I do believe that somehow we have to look at this, this issue. The second issue on the Asia Monetary Fund. It is very interesting, during the 2008 crisis, we have the Chiang Mai. But none of us went to China, Chiang Mai to get the money. The Korea went to the Fed, Singapore went to the Fed to get funding, everyone. We probably, it's about time for us to look at this issue. But if we start come up with the Asian Monetary Fund, it's probably something the uphill better. Why don't we just start to revive, focusing on, the, for example, like the Asian bond market. Something very small on the market. Yeah, start with the pilot project. And, you know, using this kind of perspective, we can use an example, a success story, to be repeated before we talk about the bigger thing, like the Asian Monetary Fund. Thank you. Sir, at that you. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Halim. I'm doing research on Islamic finance. Uh, my first question is, uh, two days ago I read an article from a local newspaper uh, on uh, economic is a religion, not a sign. Uh, can you explain that? Economic is a religion, not a sign. Thank That's, you. Thank you for the deep question. You, sir. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam. Saya Syarif Shah, from Veteran Number. Uh, but I think my question is simple. I always believe, and I think you mentioned just now, that we should, we, when I say we, is not Indonesia, not Malaysia, not Singapore, not anything, but my belief is when I say we, we in ASEAN, in the context of ASEAN. I'm uh, bleeding because uh, he's actually uh, my good friend from Bangalore is the part of my question. So I have to divert it such a way that it is slightly different, but uh, what I need to know from you, your Excellency. The Latin American countries, Your Excellency, has organized such a way, because I'm involved with some of the embassies in my friendship with them. They have organized such a system, as not all of them, I mean, but majority of them have organized such a thing of being self-sufficed among themselves. Example, a country has got sugar, exports to another Latin American country, or another country has got petroleum, gives it cheaper to another Latin American country, and they sort of cooperate such a way that they are Lessening the dependence on the Western countries. Okay, my question now, Your Excellency, 
Indonesia being the biggest Muslim country in the world now, I believe. Secondly, it is also the biggest economical, a potential economical country in ASEAN. Thirdly, it is also the most populated country in ASEAN. What is the, as you say, the plan of Indonesia to, oh my God, to come up with ideas so that this kind of cooperation what is happening in Latin American countries and I believe it is happening with India and a few neighboring countries. Can that be done in ASEAN, where the ASEAN countries cooperate the way these other good blocks are doing? To so that we will be less dependent on Western, not only dependent, subservient to Western countries. That's all we Thank you. <coughs> so, the sequencing and how does it differ from other ASEAN members? Okay. It's a very good question. Thank you very much. First, I think when we talk about ASEAN, this is, this is a thing that I shared uh, about a couple of days ago in Davos as well, uh, on the topic of the reshaping ASEAN growth. When I listen to other panelists, we always come up with the idea about what we want in terms of ASEAN. ASEAN should be like this, should be with this good. But one thing I would like to share my view from different perspective. I think we have to look at also from the global context, if we're talking about ASEAN. Yeah, I don't know whether Professor Wu agree with me or not, but looking at the US economy with their between deficit and the current account and also by the deficit. Maybe, I don't know, not, maybe not now, but in the future they need to do a rebalancing. If they do the rebalancing, then some of the contribution of the global growth should come from this region. It's maybe India with the, um, South Asia, East Asia, Japan, China, and ASEAN. Because really, this is really the market. Then the question is, how do we put context in this global context? The way I look at the future of the trade, that will be on the production network. That will be on the global supply chain. So if we're talking about, if we want to, to sort of like to set up about the position of ASEAN, our intra-trade, this should be a part of this production network. This should be part of the supply chains. And the essence of this modern business is really the supply chains. It's logistic. We need to cooperate to improve, for example, start by, for example, focus on connectivity. This is the thing that's a very important one. We improve the connectivity, we reduce the logistic costs, then we can talk about this production network. Don't forget, it is true, very important for us to look at ASEAN, but don't forget the final buyer still come from advanced country. So even though the ASEAN still work as a production network, we have to look at about the final buyer itself. Whether it's a country, advanced country like Europe, like United States, and the important role is also China. Because most of our, our, our export from Southeast Asian economy is also depend on what's happening in Chinese economy. So I think we have to do sort of like a balancing out of it geopolitically between China, Japan, East Asia, and put it into the production network. Of course, a country like Indonesia, as the, in terms of size and population, uh, probably the largest in, in ASEAN, should play a role, should play a leadership. But the problem here, let me be frank and open with you, the problem with the ASEAN is there are two countries sitting in the back, but the driver, they don't know where to go. The passenger, they fight with other, but the driver, they don't know where to go. So we have to use this opportunity. In the sense, yes, we should take an opportunity about this production network, yeah, about the geopolitical possibility. Let me give a very concrete example about Indonesia. I've been raising this issue several times 
initially was this idea was not fully supported. I said that a country like Indonesia, we with the 240 million population, there is no way that Indonesia can fulfill their domestic needs by producing locally because we don't have enough resources for that. Somehow we need to open, like rice, we need to import even some, even cement, even car, everything. But if Indonesia would like to play a role, what Indonesia needs to do is perhaps to do an acquisition in other countries. Like one Indonesian cement company, they bought the they, they do an acquisition with Vietnam. So every time we import the cement, we import from an Indonesian company. So we become the part of this production network of this, you know, uh, the global supply chains. This will be the future of us. And if you're talking about this production network, etc., this needs to be supported by a very competitive services sector, including in the financial sector. Unfortunately, if you're talking about services, it's been always been overlooked. Yeah? And I think we have to treat services not only as a sector, but as an input for the manufacturing sector. Thank you, uh, Dr. Basri, for reminding us that one of the first things we need to achieve in ASEAN, especially for the ASEAN economic community that's coming, is to improve connectivity within ASEAN. And then, talking about the situation back home has some very concrete uh, implications. Number one, in order to ship goods from Java to Kota Kinabalu, the goods have to first ship to Klang and put on Malaysian boats to then ship to Kuching and to Kota Kinabalu. So, within Malaysia, we have to make adjustments to that couple catch policies which require, which end up in monopoly shipping from, uh, of goods from Klang to the rest of East Malaysia. And of course, that uh, strengthens your point about uh, regional uh, development and also about fighting inflation. You fight inflation by removing the monopolies. This is a good way. And another big conductive connectivity would be to get a true high-speed train between Singapore and Kuala Lumpur all the way to Penang. I can't understand why you would build something halfway. So, yes, you lay and I, and I. Uh, I'm Michelle, uh, Michelle Chia from CIND. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Basri, for this most timely and relevant uh, lecture. Uh, just got one question, uh, you know, with regards to Indonesia. Uh, I think that the recent turmoil in Argentina has reminded us about the fragility uh, that the world is in, uh, with regards to capital flows, especially in the emerging markets. And I just want to ask you, uh, in a hypothetical situation where capital flows turn disorderly, uh, what does the Ministry of Finance and what the policy makers in Indonesia uh, have in plan? I know you have a bond stabilization framework as well as a crisis protocol management, but could you also explain in more detail how the government and Bank Indonesia uh, can take uh, steps to mitigate Thank you. Thank you. You, sir? Uh, my name is Ari. I'm from Robin Capital. I have two questions, actually. Um, the first one is, um, the, you've been talking about uh, logistics several times. You mentioned it, uh, Dr. Bashi. So why not uh, you guys look at setting up an ASEAN infrastructure uh, integration fund? Like in Europe, they have money for roads to connect all the countries. Uh, uh, rail networks and whatnot, uh, and probably you need to legislate this in all the individual countries in ASEAN. Uh, otherwise, you would have a lot of roadblocks, uh, like some that have been mentioned earlier. Um, my second question is, is more of asking for your opinion. Uh, what is your opinion on a single ASEAN currency? This has been talked about over the past decade. I think it's important to have it because if you take Malaysia for an example. There are a lot of uh, Indonesian uh, workers here in Malaysia, and every time they send money to Western Union, it's converted to dollars and then reconverted to rupiah. And someone else is making the money. It's not an ASEAN company anyway. So it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, so 
How soon can we have something like that? Life is too short to waste. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Your name and affiliation, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Bokalo Rajan Sumarati, uh, Monash University, Summer Campus. I have a couple of questions, uh, Honorable Minister. Um, Ask your most important question. <laughs> the first most important question. <laughs> I heard you talking about how you, you don't like the industrial policy uh, with regard to certain economic uh, issues in Indonesia. Um, I am a fan of uh, industrialization processes. So um, I'm going to ask this question that um, have Indonesia ever considered offering fiscal incentives to companies to set up industries in the remote areas and rural areas? Because this concerns the point that you mentioned that every year you receive 2 million uh, new entrants as we are looking for jobs and are only able to accommodate around 250,000 uh, job seekers. So my question was in relation to that, offering fiscal incentives to companies setting up in remote areas and rural areas. The second most That's important enough. question. <laughs> we stop that because the country God has a question. I want to ask the minister uh, whether he welcomes investments from uh, one of the uh, companies in Malaysia like Sunway, QL, uh, Sangabi, you know, all the investments in Malaysia. And how do they go about it? But in, since Indonesia is uh, the last country and the provincial and, and, and federal and uh, national governments, how do we go uh, about investing and, and, and getting results? Thank you. Um, let me address the first question first regarding the set of loans. I know this is a very delicate issue because this has to do with the confidence, with the good macroeconomic policy. Um, I know some, a country like Malaysia, back in 1998, if I'm not mistaken, in addressing the issue, Malaysia imposing a capital control at a time. But I don't think Indonesia will choose this policy for two reasons. The first one is because if we want to a sort of like impose the capital control, we have to amend our law. And it costs us, if you deal with the parliament, talk with the parliament, it costs you probably about a year before you implement the capital already you leave the country. So that's very happy. But the second issue, I think, is very important. I'm a good believer that the capital will always come to the country if you maintain the good macroeconomic policy. Because at the end of the day, they are looking for return. So if we focusing, continue focusing on inflation, but it's in the past four years we've been able to manage inflation, hopefully this year will be around less than 6%, probably about 4.5 to 5%. We maintain growth, and the consistency of the policy. I believe that will be the key. But in addition to that, we at the Ministry of Finance, we are preparing this policy. Um, I just give the sneak preview. Otherwise, I don't have any materials for the press conference later on when I announce this policy. Um, we do understand about this COVID tax, right? So if people in past or put a a sort of like capital inflow in the short term, we tax them. The longer term, the tax will be lower, or probably zero tax. What, what, the thing that I would like to introduce in Indonesia is, because it's very difficult to implement this, this Tobin tax in Indonesia, is the reverse of the Tobin tax. The foreign investment, they come to Indonesia, they invest in Indonesia, usually at the end of the year, they do the profit repatriation. This will affect the capital account side. So the new policy will be announced by the government is if instead of you do the repatriation, but you reinvest that, then your dividend tax will be zero. So it means that the money 
will be around the country. This will expand. Address your question again about the job creation. But again, back to your question, I don't think Indonesia will choose the capital control because we believe that inflation is really the key issue. We've been able to maintain this. I think the appetite is still there. And the first week of January, we issued the global bonds. Initially, we plan to have three billion US dollars, but since the incoming week, 17.5 billion US dollars is almost three times. We upsize to become four billion US dollars. And you know, most of the panels is 15 to 13 years, to 30 years. It means that people still believe in Indonesia 30 years from now for the long term. The confidence is still there. Yeah, so I do believe that that kind of policy will prevent. Of course, the fluctuation was still happening in, in Argentina, the way I look at it, is because it's very difficult to continue to support a sort of like this, this, um, this quote unquote, the quasi fixed exchange rate. Yeah, so the central bank has to do something about it. Uh, this, for the second question, the second question, I think this has to do with the issue of this uh, industrial premium. Uh, the industrial policy? Yeah, the industrial policy, what kind of fiscal incentive that government could provide? Um, there are some sectors that the government provide incentive, which is I mentioned to you earlier. If the company would like to have the r in Indonesia to do a training. So the way I look at the situation is the industrial policy would be justified if we focus on the input rather than outcome. Because if we focus on the output, the outcome, and it always ends up with the issue of the density. Not many countries in the world have been successful with industrial policy. Maybe Korea, but Korea is also a sort of like so so not 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 very clear about it. So so the incentive will be given for that particular sectors and also some sectors with this what I call the intermediate products. Because one of the problems in Indonesia is in the manufacturing industry is whole middle. We do have a strong industry in the um, downstream but not supporting industry. So we provide the fiscal incentive. I know that kind of policy is distorted. Yeah, but somehow, we need to be very, uh, rather pragmatic. Regarding the single ASEAN currency, it's very difficult for me to comment this particular issue. Yeah. But you, you mentioned because I think before we, we decide to go for the single ASEAN currency, I think we have to learn from the experience in, uh, in EU as well, in Europe as well, because the divergence of the economy, the development gaps among some ASEAN countries. Yeah? Probably we have to look at this issue carefully. But if you're concerned about this, paying money to the Western Union, I have a solution for this. Just use the technology for the uh, mobile phone technology, like in Kenya, which is really reduced the transaction cost quite substantially. If you want to do the financial inclusion, running construction, people can send money to the people in the rural area. Maybe these people, their neighbor, they don't have account in the bank, but these people can be a bank to other people. So it really depends on the, whether the central bank later on will provide a sort of like license for this. Yeah? So I think this has to do with the issue of the, of the transaction cost. Now, Tansi, regarding your investment, of course, Indonesia will certainly welcome of it. Um, and we will support any investment because we do believe that, as I said to you, that if we focus on this production network, we are not talking about Malaysia, we are not talking about Singapore, we are not talking about Indonesia, but we in ASEAN, 600 million, will get this economy of scale. And by doing it, then we can be very efficient. Thank you very much. Excuse me, Professor, this is not a question, this is a comment, okay? This I'm sorry? Just a little last comment. I would like to congratulate uh, the Honorable Minister for his brilliant uh, discourse today. I came with a very open mind, don't know what to expect, but uh, simply brilliant, I said, I would like to say. And the only thing that I can disagree with the uh, Minister is that I think he's been very modest to say that the Indonesia, uh, when he touched on the brain drain issue, that, uh, you know, 
we don't have much brains, but I tend to disagree. I, I believe, like, uh, with a population of 240 million, in, in terms of absolute numbers, I think you have a lot of brains. My encounters uh, at a personal level, uh, at a domestic level, we have a, a domestic helper who has been with us for more than 10 years, and I think she is brilliant and she is very intelligent. I think she has caught in a poverty trap. Okay? The predecessor went back and she has now got a very thriving catering business. So perhaps, you know, in terms of uh, academic brain, you may be lacking, but I think in terms of entrepreneurship, I think Indonesia has got plenty. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 so, I want to invite Tan Siri Jadicha to present a small token uh, to Mr. Dr. Pastry.